Continuing from the Neon Wilderness, this story is called That's the Way It's Always Been. The author of these stories is, in point of fact, Nelson Algrant. Uh, okay. We used to stand revelling in Wales, with the smoke from the mess hall blowing into the rain. In the east, the sky would be torn with light, like a sky going pleasantly insane. With a particular sort of savagery in the way the orderly room wires cut blindly across it. The days like the sky passed in a pleasant decadence. They were conducted for us by mildly demented quacks and a few specially selected cretins. One day would be about the same as the next. Chow, inspection, and then, like a call to arms, all men not on detail would be subbed to a stoveless, chairless Nissen hut on a hill to listen to the man without any brains beat his gums till noon. The rank and file preferred detail to listening to the man. He had no back to his head, and the tip of his little sniffing nose was as fiery as his hair. He would begin by assuring us that the Germans were halfway to the channel ports, that some of us wouldn't be seen another Christmas, but that he, the man without any brains, would see us through. If that man had a hummingbird's brains, he'd fly backwards, one hillbilly used to say of him. If what he got his brains, I'll take horse manure. This Kansas abortionist who wore silver leaves on his padded shoulders would have wept had the war ended, leaving him only leaves instead of the eagles for which he lived. I get frightened sometimes, he confided to one of the officers, that the war might end before we really get in the thick of it. There's your communication zone hero for you. The only thing he fears on earth is being home in bed with his wife instead of advancing contentedly against German mortar fire. Not that he had courage. It was just that he needed a florid screen of ribbons and citations and decorations behind which to conceal the whimpering little embryo that was in reality all that there was to Colonel Bull. He was a washout and he sensed it, but he couldn't face it. He had to face panzers, no matter how much he feared them, in order to appear to himself as a whole man. And there wasn't enough firepower in the whole European theater to make a man of that strutting stage prop. If the enlisted men get to hate, hating one of my numcums, then I know I have one numcum who's doing his job all the way, he was fond of saying. We'd have to crowd into the unheated Nissen hut to listen to stuff like that. He was as phony as a three-dollar bill and as vain as a perfume matinee idol. He'd wind up advising us that under any circumstances in garrison or field, he was sure we'd always live up to the proud tradition of combat medics. We would always remember that the wounded came first. As though we planned secretly, each night in barracks, to abandon the litters and finish off the cripples at the first whine of an 88 overhead. It'll go hard with the man who fails to remember that, he'd remind us with a smile, as reassuring as that of a half-crushed snake. After the wounded, the enlisted men raided next, said Colonel Bull. If there were a shortage of chow, what there was would go to the men. He would tell us this brazenly, although the chow was already short, because his officers were using the enlisted men's mess to entertain their Welsh girlfriends. Our breakfast had been reduced to tea and pep because the eggs and oranges were consumed nightly by the officers' happy little consorts. They never used their own rations to bargain for the girls' favors. It was cheaper to use ours. When the enlisted men bitched about the monotony of pep and tea for breakfast, the mess sergeant defended himself by reporting that his supplies were being raided. He didn't say by whom, but everyone knew that only enlisted men could do such a thing with the result that we got an extra night detail of guarding the mess hall from other enlisted men while the officers rioted within, still frying our eggs and scattering orange peelings over the floor for us to police up in the morning. Well, we brought it on ourselves, the chaplain assured us. That's the way it's always been, he said, so I guess that's how it's going to be. At least it doesn't look like anyone's going to change it. We quit bitching about breakfast, and the guard detail was held like the Damascene sword in a bayonet. The most comical aspect of the colonel's attitude was that he sincerely felt we had confidence in him and his staff. In the presence of the officer, officers, he'd assure us that when we went into mined areas, it would always be the officers who would take the main chance. 
It would be their sacred trust never to expose an enlisted man to landmines unnecessarily, since the latter were the backbone of the whole hospital. While to a man we knew that not an officer there would risk the skin of his little finger for the colonel, there was still an EM available to risk his behind instead. Most of them would have sent out their mothers with detectors before putting a foot on mind earth themselves. They were all heroes on the bar front. But in the zone, no. After the enlisted men came the nurses, who were officers first and women only incidentally, we were told. Yet we always had the impression that the officers prized them more for their femininity than for their bars. And when it came down to it, they turned out to be better men than the officers. They worked at their jobs, and off-duty had more innate common decency than all the male brass combined. They earned their pay, and they maintained discipline among themselves. And sometimes, when no officer was looking, they shortened their work by doing things their own way rather than according to the colonel's book, the way it had always been, that no one was going to change. But your average second lieutenant is a loose fish and a disciplinarian to boot. He'll check you for a loose button on your field jacket, go off and get himself so drunk that he's sick in the taxi coming home, but be damn certain that the first thing he'll do as soon as he's borrowed taxi fare and his head has stopped aching will be to check you on that loose button. He'll show you he's one who remembers one day to the next and no nonsense about it, though the borrowed taxi fare is already forgotten and he's off for the hair of the dog that bit him. Discipline is what he believes in, the stuffed hyena. Discipline for you, and the little girls for him, you'll find out soon enough. Last of all, the hero who must go down with the ship, the one who will stand like Jackson at Antietam or wherever it was, even though a Mark IV is bearing down on him, the one for whom no sacrifice is too great, and no enlisted man's trouble too small to minister, was Colonel Bull himself, the self-same hero who must be served first, though he's the last to get up in the morning at a table by himself, with his plate warmed to just the right temperature. No, it didn't do any good, his telling us where he was going to be when the going got tough and the guns got hot. He'd sent our best nurse back to the States, properly knocked up to await a dishonorable discharge because of his personal carelessness, and another had transferred out to avoid his pursuit. We knew where he'd be all right, the little remaindered lush. He'd be after the nurses when they were off duty and nursing a fifth of old Quaker when they weren't. He'd show us how cool he could be all right if there was enough ice left for the highballs. This pint-sized poser would have liked to live on a platform, but in barracks the hillbillies spoke of him as children might of the first clown they'd ever seen, laughter tinged by fear. He made them mad, but he was ridiculous to them too particularly when he'd deliver a threatening epilogue on security and how some of the enlisted personnel were endangering their own lives as well as those of their buddies by talking too freely in town. The truth was that our most accurate rumors came from town, for we were always preceded there by officers who consorted with everything in skirts and sometimes flitted from sex to sex like so many butterflies. It was all one the numcums could be depended upon to get them back to garrison. The civilians always knew. They told us our sailing date, when the ambulances would leave, when the advanced party would land, and the kind of ration we'd carry. They knew everything, even the name of the boat, and not an enlisted man had had a pass in three days to hand out anything like that. Everything was known in town, and everything in garrison was hushed. After the officers had left the horse out, we were blamed because the barn doors were open. Even in barracks, troop movements were not to be discussed, lest there be a fifth columnist under the stove. While the officers' boastful confidences to their civilian friends were being openly mulled over in the Welsh streets, the officers drank up their own liquor ration, then they consumed the nurses. When that was done away with, the chaplain slipped them half our cigarettes to trade off in town for Irish whiskey, and all the while keeping a sharp eye out for excesses on the part of the enlisted men. Precious little danger of excesses there was on our part. We couldn't get to town often enough for that. It was all we could do to get our cigarettes, candy, and soap out of the chaplain before he sold them. We only paid a half dollar a carton for cigarettes, and he could get ten and twenty times that amount from the civilians. 
He could hardly blame the chaplain. He was out for all he could get. The colonel had set the example. And all the other marked down med school Don Juans had followed suit. You ought to have seen them at Chow, the mess sergeant would chortle. My old man Sal got better manners. The nurses breakfast, breakfasted once with the man and his staff, and thereafter refused flatly to come into the mess until the officers had left. All the while we were in Wales, they ate after the officers, preferring to subsist on what was left rather than to tolerate the overweening vanity, inbred bad manners, and unrestrained swinishness of these cavaliers. The colonel first, the officers next, according to rank, then the nurses, the enlisted men, and finally, God help them, the wounded. That's how it really went in the hut 2-5. We may outnumber them, the mess sergeant mourned, but they sure as hell outweigh us. It wasn't an outfit. It was just a couple hundred oddly assorted Tennesseans, Texans, and Chicagoans who wanted to go back to their respective hills, ranches, and streets. When we reached the Rhine, the Germans were using hazardous fire over our heads toward an artillery emplacement to our rear. In his haste to get those eagles, the man had brought us 40 miles ahead of our clearing station. They were looking for us to their rear. We were supposed to be 10 miles behind them to evacuate their wounded. Instead, we were raising ward tents, ankle deep in Kraut mutual tickets on a bombed out racetrack in the woods above Dusseldorf. We put up the whole circus at night under fire, including a tent to be used as an officer's club, and that one was up before we could erect our own squad tents. The day we went to operation, the man summoned us, and we listened, standing at ease, while he outlined the history of mankind from the Peloponnesian Wars to the Lindbergh kidnapping, which was the last time he'd read a newspaper. We stayed there two weeks while the 94th Division casualties were being bumped blindly about over rutted roads 50 miles to our rear looking for us. The only ones who knew where we were were the Krauts, and they were too busy to give a damn what we were doing there. We finally got two patients, a Kraut kid who came running up with his hands blown off from fooling around with a booby trap in the woods, and the man. He had had a slit trench dug in his tent, had had his cot and himself lowered gently into it, and had slept there, safe from concussion, according to the book. But he caught a heavy cold, and for hours we lived in a trembling hope that it might develop into pneumonia. There wasn't an enlisted man in the outfit who wouldn't have passed up Chow for a chance to throw a shovel of dirt across that phony fizz. I'll contribute my mattress cover any time, we assured each other, and more than one really meant that all the way down. The only officer we had who worked at his job was an Assyrian with a face like a side of mutton. He undertook everything in the hope of someday becoming a first lieutenant. Even the first soldier ordered him around. Morning till night, he directed athletics, ran errands for special service, gave us talks on sex hygiene, military courtesy, and orientation. He was into everything, knew nothing, and we always liked to hear him for his phenomenal knack of saying exactly the opposite of what he intended. And when he gave us callisnoconectics, as he called them, that was the best. Let your arms hang loosely and your legs parallel your stomach, he would order. For some reason, he called the stomach muscles stahara, the great rolling of the R. Then he'd have us growl at each other while we rolled the muscles of the stahara. It was so absolutely idiotic, and he was such an absolute idiot that we'd growl and froth and snarl like so many hyenas just to hear him keep on. Quigley, men, quigley, throw the right simultaneously but simultaneously with what we never knew. The other officers were out looting. A captain returned with two German dental chairs and detailed four enlisted men to disassemble and box them for shipment. Swiney, who had been a bellhop before getting his commission, came up with two Great Danes, immediately chained them to the enlisted men's mess, and set them to work on the EM rations. They hadn't eaten in days. We didn't say a word. There weren't any more regulations covering Great Danes than there were to cover officers. We'd learned that long ago. Then De Forty, the mess officer, announced that champagne and cognac would be available to the men after evening chow for 50 marks a bottle, which was cheap. Money was easy, and five bucks wouldn't break anybody. 
Nevertheless, we learned from the mess sergeant, who was getting fed up, that it had been requisitioned with the understanding that its distribution among the men was to be without cost. De Forty was chiseling the mess sergeant out of his cut. To make it stick, he broke him the following week, and he didn't get his stripes back till he stopped wondering publicly how De Forty was able to send home a check for twice his officer's pay every month. But the chaplain was the busiest of all. His name was Engel, and he had a furtive, lopsided face, more like that of an Aberdeen rabbit than that of a man. He was an officer first and a chaplain only as an afterthought. His assistant conducted services for him, for Chappie was either in bed Sunday mornings, nursing a hangover, or was hanging over a nurse in bed. Sometimes the colonel dispatched him for loose on Sundays, and it upset Ingle to have to drive the jeep himself then, for his assistant would be conducting services for the faithful. So he was given a second assistant as a driver, and toward evening would return with a jeep load of lakas, binoculars, mausers, and grave swords, and even one of those global maps which revolve on a pedestal for a schoolroom. The officers hand-picked the load, according to rank and seniority, with the colonel first and the Aberdeen rabbit anxiously bringing up the rear. Then followed the first soldier and the first three grades of numcums. By the time it got down to the PFCs and buck privates, there were usually a couple broken swords, a box camera or two often made in the States, and a beat-out Mauser remaining. We could help ourselves then, but were warned not to be greedy about it, to act like soldiers and not like a bunch of damned inward. That was the colonel's phrase. Act like white men just for once, he'd plead. After he'd sent home five Lakas, four Lugers, two sets of binoculars, a set of Russian furs, and at least a quart of a perfume called Queer de Russi. Chappie didn't care for souvenirs for themselves. He took them in order to sell them, and he always had a few kraut ashtrays, iron crosses, and SS belt buckles which were available to the men through his assistant at reasonable rates. On VE day, Private First Class Hindi got a letter from home. His brother had been killed at Okinawa. We heard him crying six-tenths away, one of those surly, closed-mouthed kids who takes orders well but never makes friends. If you made a friendly remark to him, he'd look at you suspiciously. And if you repeated it, he'd offer to climb all over you for a nickel. That's how he was. He could take care of himself, he said. But he couldn't that morning. No one knew what to do with him. When the men in his own tent tried to console him, he wandered away from them, trying blindly to be somewhere alone, and sat down at last in the rain against a half-empty lister bag with the letter crumpled in his hand and getting splotched from the rain. He sat there with his mouth open, bareheaded, looking oddly thin and small, his face wet with rain and anguish. He didn't even know where he was, it looked like. Heartbreak is harder to look on than death sometimes. Somebody went and told Engel, and Engel sent both his assistants. They stood in the rain looking down at Hindi, a T5 and a PFC. When he had cried himself out, they supported him back to his cot. Somebody gave him a drink. And the next day, he was as closed-mouthed and surly as ever. Ingle never even asked what had happened to him. Still, that's the sort of man you were expected to salute, to wait on, to respect, and even to confide in. They couldn't get interested in the war, our officers. They didn't know what it was all about, and they didn't want to learn. All they were aware of was rank, whiskey, women, grub, and gossip. All their waking hours were devoted to these ends, distracted only occasionally by an enlisted man who had been caught fraternizing. For it wasn't only forbidden us to fraternize with the Germans, Poles, Russians, Netherlanders, Belgians, French, and Yugoslavs were equally verboten. We couldn't fraternize with any of these, we were informed, for the simple reason that if they were Germans, they'd tell us they were something else, and we lacking the officer's astuteness, just couldn't tell the difference. Even association with our own nurses was frowned on by the man. He was as jealous of them as a ram of a flock of ewes. What he couldn't have himself, he didn't want anyone else to have. Like a dog, what he couldn't eat himself, he defiled.
Risen from his sick bed, he crept about the outskirts of the hospital area for a few minutes each evening with a pale and wall-eyed look. What he was looking for there, no one knew. He slept with a bottle, rose with it, and wandered about in the dusk aimlessly. Perhaps he felt that in the dimness he might not be taken for an officer and some enlisted man would fail to salute him. He needed the assurance of the salute desperately. It made him feel that, after all, he wasn't such a big stuffed bum as some people seemed to think. But we all knew that creepy shuffle, and he never failed to get a proper salute. For two weeks we hadn't tasted fresh meat. That would have been all right, but for the man giving a little party for a few nurses and officers at his quarters, and ordering us to build a barbecue pit one Saturday afternoon because it had to be ready for the party on Sunday, we had dehydrated potatoes, cold Argentine corned beef right out of the can, an oatmeal pudding with cocoa spilled over it while they were frying steaks. Yes, and we policed up the empty whiskey bottles the morning after, too, and the cigarette butts as well. The same day I received a letter from my wife saying, Finish the job so that you can get back home. We are proud of what you are doing. She was proud of what we were doing. I got checked one morning for going to chow in shorts. The man checked me personally. You'll either wear pants in the mess hall or you won't eat here. Well, a rule's a rule. But the same afternoon he came to dinner himself in shorts. That's my privilege, he explained. It's the way it's always been, the Aberdeen rabbit said sagely. So I guess that's how it's got to be, fellas. At least I don't see any chance of changing it right now. One day we discovered through secret channels that we had $152 in the company fund, so we figured we could have a company party. The first soldier asked the colonel, and he gave permission for us to drop into cases of beer. Saturday was going to be a big day for us, free beer and a couple of boxing bouts and lots of fun. On Saturday, the man came with us to pick up the beer, and we were saying that maybe he wasn't such a bad egg after all. But when we were ready to pick it up, he decided 50 cases was too many and would only pay for 30. When we got back to camp, he took five cases for himself. Nobody protested and nobody bitched. He told the mess sergeant to ice up the remaining beer for us with as grand a gesture as though it were a personal gift. Not a man attended the party. Some went to the movies, some wandered off, and some just sulked, saying they didn't feel well or had taken the pledge or something. The next morning, the man called his numcums together and told them we'd all pay for ignoring the party after all the trouble he'd gone to for us. We would get up half an hour earlier, work half an hour later, and if necessary, do eight hours of close order drill a day. Also, our tents weren't in good shape. And unless they were spick and span right off, inspections would be held twice a day. Then he pulled out the articles of war, read the paragraphs dealing with mutiny and sedition, and ordered everyone back to work as though nothing had happened. Go back to your tents and forget it, he told them, abruptly forgiving them all. The chaplain, however, stood us in good stead. That's the way it's always been, he said, so that's how it's got to be. At least, I don't see much chance of making any changes right now, fellas. You understand. We understood all right.